Quiet. <laughs> well done, Glenn. May, I'll ask you to take your seats if you would. Um, good morning. I'm Susan Bell with the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Before our panel begins, I have two two announcements. I want to remind you that following this panel, we have the at lunch sessions. The names of the speakers and leaders will be placed at the table, but you have a list in your packet on the right-hand side of who uh, who those leaders are. And added to that is Olaro Tunu of the UN, um, who will also be at a table. Um, the ever clever uh, Global Philanthropy Forum staff has come up uh, with a very creative way to respond to all of your needs, um, which are uh, to combine networking with exercise by asking you immediately following this panel to leap from your seats and walk back outside or to the side so the um, lunch tables can be set by the staff here. So you will, you will be asked to... Uh, leave <laughs> for about 10 to 15 minutes and then come back for the at-lunch sessions. Um, second, I wanted to also call your attention to the questionnaires that you need to fill out in the folders. They are on the right side of your folder, about uh, three pages in, I believe. This panel will consider important levers for social change, science, and technology. We'll focus on two complex issues. One, the role of science and technology as a tool for advancing human development and addressing some of the contributors to poverty. Two, the application of science and technology to environmental concerns, either as a diagnostic tool for problems like climate change or as solutions such as green technologies aimed at advancing development in a manner that is sustainable. While focusing on these issues, we will also address the importance of creating and distributing technologies that are appropriate both to the end user and to the circumstances. Martin Fisher will provide us with a case study from his work in Africa about why sometimes the low-tech solution may matter most. He will have a demonstration of a water pump as part of this as well, but we do not believe that you need umbrellas. It should be safe. Um, we have three distinguished panelists today. Uh, with whom I'm going to use uh, sort of an interview format um, before turning to you for questions. Susan packard -Orr is founder, ch uh, chairman of the board, and CEO of Teloso, which provides fundraising and grants management software to the nonprofit sector. She's also chairman of the David and Lucille Packard Foundation. Lou Coleman is in his third year as president of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation after spending close to four decades in the banking industry. And Martin Fisher is executive director, director of Aprotech International, which develops and promotes new low-cost technologies for local entrepreneurs to establish small commercial businesses and farms in Africa. The first issue um, I will put out here, and then the um, panelists will respond from um, their chairs. Um, Susan Packard Orr and then Lou Coleman, could you address the role of science technology in advancing human development and addressing poverty? Well, first of all, I'd like to say it's a real inspiration to be here today and particularly to listen to the people who are on the ground doing the real work out there. And from the point of view of funders, I, I always feel that we, we bring very little to the table, we bring the money, but everybody else does all the work and it's really great to hear from the people who are doing that. Uh, and I'm going to talk about, obviously, from, can't, you can't hear? Okay, a little closer. Okay, I don't want to be too loud. Now I'm hearing a little echo. That's okay. All right. Well, uh, toward the end of uh, his life, my father liked to give the same speech, and he gave it many, many times, and I heard it many times, and maybe some of you heard it too. And he always started like this. He said, all of the progress we have made in the 20th century was based on science done in the 19th century. And he always emphasized the word science. Now, well, you could argue about the exact dates that some of the major breakthroughs were made, obviously a lot in the 20th century too. His point was really twofold. One is that science is really fundamental to human progress. And two is that it's very difficult to predict, of course, what might result from scientific breakthrough and when that result might occur. Now, because of Father's very fundamental opinion and view about science as a lever for change, 
Um, at his personal direction, the Packard Foundation has had two major programs for many, many years, and we expect to continue these two particular programs more or less indefinitely, which is kind of unusual for a foundation to do. Uh, the first is the Packard Fellows in Science and Engineering, and every year we select 20 of the best and brightest young scientists and engineers from U.S. universities and give them five years of more or less unconditional support for them to pursue whatever it is that they're pursuing. And the second is the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institution, which is focused in scientific exploration of the oceans, particularly in, in uh, Monterey Bay. Uh, but that has a very heavy engineering component with the idea that what they learn in that will be translatable to oceans, deep ocean research around the world. Now, I mention these both uh, rather briefly, but they have formed the heart of our science program at the Packard Foundation for many, many years. Now, even though uh, both of these may eventually have global impact, and in fact, some of, the, some of the scientists that have been working, of course, already have, neither one is international in focus. And so I want to really turn to um, some other things that we're working on. Uh, in 1999, the National Academy of Sciences published a book called Our Common Journey, and maybe some of you have seen this little book. It looks like this. I have it up here if you want to come and look at it. Um, the book lays out the primary goals of a transition towards sustainability over the next two generations, and they list three goals. To meet the needs of a much larger but stabilizing human population, to sustain the life support systems of the planet, and to substantially reduce hunger and poverty. Now, to make this trans transition, uh, we need much more basic knowledge than we have now about the interaction between the Earth's systems and human populations. Now, the human development, of course, and its impact on the environment is a very, very complex set of interacting forces. And um, the scientific research community, of course, is very discipline-based and exists in its silos. And so what is recommended in this book is the development of a new field. And in this new field, um, it will be much more interdisciplinary We'll have to cut across, of course, the traditional scientific fields, but we'll also have to include uh, economics, public policy, soci sociology, et cetera, et cetera. Now, not only are scholars in these areas not accustomed to working together, as you all know, if, if you've tried to get any funding in scientific research, it's very difficult to get funded for interdisciplinary work. And, of course, it's going to be very important in all of this work that it include in-country scientists as well, that it's not just work that goes on in the developed world and then is flunked over, as we've heard multiple times already this morning. So with this book was born a new term, sustainability science. And the Packard Foundation has taken this idea to heart, and we have nurtured the birth of this new field by supporting a number of conferences where scientists have come together to talk about what this means and what the agenda is going to be of this new field. So what exactly is sustainability science? Well, of course, the, the area is huge. It can range from global warming to habitat destruction, interactions of agriculture, water, land use, on and on and on. I'm sure you can all think of a number of things. It's so big that it's hard to kind of get your hands around what you could do in this field. And so I just proposed four different approaches that could be taken. One is to look at the global, the global scale. Of course, there's a lot of work going on in, in uh, global warming, also such things as economic globalization and its impacts, market incentives, population dynamics. We heard about trade issues, how those impact um, the world. Or you can focus on a particular market sector, for example, energy or the forests or fisheries, which is one that the Packard Foundation has been working on um, for a number of years. Or you can focus on what's called place-based science, which means you take a very small region and you look at all aspects of what is happening. And, and if we have time later, I have an example of a place-based project that we've been working on. Or you could focus on the question of linking all this knowledge to action so it's all well and good to develop all the scientific knowledge, but then how does it really translate? So we at the Packard Foundation are really working on this, defining our own approach to this, and uh, exactly where we're going to go with it, we're not sure, but it's an exciting new field that I think has a lot to offer. My turn. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, at the Moore Foundation, we have a, 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 an everlasting belief that science and technology will improve mankind uh, in a really fundamental way. Our core program areas of higher education, the environment, and science all have a common theme, which is essentially science. Uh, it's probably understandable given the background of our founder, uh, but it is clearly, we've all been vaccinated with, with this belief. So what I thought I'd do this morning briefly is to see if I couldn't at least propose a framework for thinking about how philanthropy interacts with science and technology and how that interacts with poverty and improving the human condition. Uh, we have clearly already heard this morning uh, that there is a strong relationship between health and education and poverty. Uh, the statistical correlations are extremely strong, although people still argue the causes and effects. I would like to start by making the, the point that the causes and effects from a philanthropic standpoint are probably not that important. These areas are so closely linked that if you improve one, you'll improve the other. Um, in effect, all boats will rise in the harbor. Um, there's many strategies to improve health that involve science and technology. Uh, we've seen them in action, and we've seen them in action uh, with philanthropy tagging along in a very effective way. We've eliminated smallpox from the world. Uh, no small thanks to the Rockefellers. Uh, we have almost eliminated polio. Um, we are clearly capable of eliminating the three major causes of uh, death in the third world, uh, diarrhea, tuberculosis, and hepatitis B. Uh, we know what that's about. But our problem is, is that we're dealing with sort of three bottlenecks that sit out there, three challenges. Um, the first one is, is that the information world uh, still operates with haves and have-nots. In spite of all the technology that, that we have uh, seen develop uh, the ability to distribute basic information uh, in spite of the web and everything else is a problem. And so what people know and what people ought to know and what people don't know uh, maybe doesn't look quite as dramatic as income disparities, but it is clearly a world of have and have nots. Um, science and technology, and we've seen it in the previous panel's discussion around medical uh, technology, needs infrastructure to function. And so there's this constant uh, battle of dealing with infrastructure uh, to make science and technology effective. And third, uh, and this was mentioned early on, the economic infrastructure and, I'm sorry to say, the political infrastructure. Um, are really misaligned to accomplish what science and technology can accomplish uh, when it comes to relieving poverty. But it's really around these three bottlenecks, um, the issue of information, the issue of uh, infrastructure, and the issue of incentives, where philanthropy can play a fairly dramatic role. Uh, this, if you think about it, um, makes the philanthropic questions a bit easier. Uh, it is possible to match science with infrastructure. It is clearly possible to improve information flows and to measure that you're doing that. And it's clearly possible, and we're seeing good examples of it today, to, to uh, create economic incentives. Um, I think uh, at Moore, we've taken a number of looks at all three of these strategies and have actually made grants, uh, some of which have turned out to be more interesting and, frankly, more effective than we thought. Some have turned out to be less interesting and less effective than we want. But I want to take a minute and talk about a couple of them. Um, we made a grant for a startup institution to publish scientific information, peer-reviewed, on the web. Uh, the organization is called the Public Library of Science. It operates just like most of the scientific magazines, except access is free, access is global, and there are no embargo requirements around the intellectual property. Um, we sort of thought it was a good idea. It was hard for us to do because 
Uh, we had some passionate people who were anxious to do this, but we, but we had a hard time connecting them with business people to write business plans and this type of stuff. Our grant became their dominant funding for the first five years. Uh, and we needed to do that uh, so that they appeared to be financially important to the information world. Uh, we were able to get some interesting help from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute in terms of providing their investigators with money to publish their findings uh, with the Public Library of Science. And at about that point, most of the major publications decided to sit down and have a chat around this issue of broad access, uh, embargoes, intellectual property, and the dialogue now continues. Uh, so a very interesting example of, uh, of where you can, with um, a modest amount of money and a little bit of focus, make a difference with information barriers that uh, are clearly a global problem. Uh, we have used technology um, in particular to uh, delineate or to map indigenous people's territories. Uh, Mark Plotkin is here today and sitting in the back. Uh, he's on a, I think, a breakout session, Mark. Or, so you'll hear more about him, but uh, Mark was a recipient of an early grant which in effect uses uh, GPS technology in, a, in an inexpensive, quick way to delineate the property rights of Native people and happen to delineate them in environmentally sensitive areas. So those are, those are a couple of examples. Uh, hopefully my remarks give you a bit of a framework on how to think about philanthropy and science and technology. Thank you. Thank you, Susan and Lou. Um, Martin is now going to describe um, his work, the successes and challenges in applying low-cost technologies to these issues. Thank you, Susan. Now, I first want to take you back to East Africa and tell you a story about this woman, Jane Mathendu. Jane is a single mother with three daughters and who lives on a small plot of land just east of Mount Kenya. And she was a school teacher. And as a school teacher in Kenya, you get paid about $2 a day. But she got by with this. But Jane had a dream, and her dream was to send her three daughters to university. And she knew she could never do this on that small salary. And then one day, she was in the local marketplace, and she saw this strange-looking machine being demonstrated in the local town. Now, this is a machine for making cooking oil out of sunflower seeds. You put sunflower seeds into the hopper on top of the machine there, you pull the handle up and down, and you get high-quality cooking oil and high-quality animal feed. The machine was retailing for $370, and Jane knew that if she could buy this machine, it could change her life. She saved up her money for nine months, and eventually she had enough with a little loan from her brother to actually buy the machine. Today, Jane rents a shop in town where she employs three workers full-time to manufacture cooking oil. She's making between $10 and $15 a day in profits. And she's outsourced farming to 20 farmers on a contract basis to grow sunflower for her. And she's become a community leader. She started big women's groups. She's become a role model. And most important for Jane, she sent her two daughters, the first two daughters, off to university. Now, a machine like this is great for a woman like Jane, who had an income and could think about maybe saving up $370 to buy such a machine. But what about your average African? What technologies and what businesses can the average African start? Your average Kenyan is a farmer who lives on a one or two acre plot with up to eight or ten family members and is just trying to scrape out a living just to get by. They only have one asset, that small plot of land, and they only have one basic skill, that of basic farming. What business can they start? Well, with one asset and one skill, you better use those two things to start your business. If they happen to be land and, a, and farming, the best thing you can do is to start commercial irrigated farming. Because all of a sudden, with commercial irrigated farming, you can grow three or four crops a year instead of just one or two waiting for the rain. What's more, you can grow high value fruits and vegetables instead of your subsistence crops. And best of all, you can bring them out and sell them in the dry season when the price is high. So in Kenya, you can make upwards of $2,500 per acre per season by growing fruits and vegetables with irrigation. 
And of course, a few wealthy farmers in Kenya do this. They have very fancy irrigation systems. But for the small-scale farmer, there was really no technology. A petrol pump is about $250 and hard to maintain and get petrol for. Electric pumps are much cheaper, but no one has electricity in Africa. Fewer than 10% of Africans do, certainly not in the rural area. And so what they need is a super money maker, manual irrigation pump. With this small machine here, you simply operate it like a sound master, walk back and forth. You can pull water out of a well as deep as 30 feet deep, and you can spray it onto your crops through a hose pipe or through sprinklers. And you can irrigate up to two acres with this machine. It retails at $75. Let me tell you another story. Janet Ondiek was widowed and left absolute destitute with six young children to look after. Soon, she was reduced to taking all of her children out of school and begging from relatives just to stay alive. But Janet was a fighter, and through one small corner of her two-acre plot where she lived in Western Kenya, there was a little stream that ran through that corner. And she realized that if she could use a bucket to irrigate and grow cabbages, she could at least get by. And so she put all of her children to work with a couple of buckets, but doing manual irrigation with a bucket is extremely hard work, and between them they could do much less than an eighth of an acre, but it did keep them alive. And one day Janet was selling her small pile of cabbages in the local town and she saw one of these pumps being demonstrated and sold at the local shop and she knew that if she could save up that money, this would transform her life. And it took her nine months to save up the money, having her children work extra hard with that bucket. But eventually she did. Today she irrigates the whole two acre plot. She employs two young men to do the irrigation. She made $2,000 in profits in her first year of irrigation and on top of that, all six of her children are back in school. Now, these are only two out of over 29,000 new businesses that have been started in East Africa using Afrotech technologies. But let's take a step backwards and look at poverty in East Africa, or in fact, poverty in Africa as a whole. 20% of the poverty is in the urban slums. That picture on the left is the view out of my office window in Nairobi. 15 people live in that little shack with no water, no electricity, and no sewage. In Nairobi, two million people live that way. But the real poverty in Africa, 80% of it is in the rural areas, where you have barefoot and hungry children in inadequate housing. Now, in sub-Saharan Africa, 70% of the people live on less than a dollar a day. Now, I think that figure is very misleading, because we tend to think a dollar a day. But no, less than a dollar a day. Many of them are living on 10 cents a day, or 20 cents a day. 10% of the people have 90% of the wealth. There's no middle class at all. And what this means is you have democracy in place, but democracy doesn't work with no middle class, with 90% of the wealth in 10% of the people's hands. So you have very poor governance and corrupt governments that we've all heard about. You can basically buy a vote in Africa, and we, as we've seen in Zimbabwe and other places, for about a dollar. But let's go even further back and say, why, what has happened to the average life of the average poor person in the world in the last 10 or 15 years? For the average poor person worldwide, they have moved essentially from a subsistence and controlled economy into a cash-based economy. Since before the Cold War, during the Cold War, we were pumping so much money into these countries between the US and the Soviet Union that effectively most poor countries could provide free health care and free education. And on top of that, the governments would highly subsidize at very low prices essential commodities like cooking oil and sugar and tea. So you really didn't need much money to get by. You could grow a subsistence crop, you could sell a little bit of it, just enough to buy your oil and, and sugar, and you could get through and educate your kids and look after your family. But all that has drastically changed with structural adjustment. Now they've been thrown into a cash-based economy. They have to pay for food, they have to pay for education, they have to pay for health care, farm inputs. In fact, the most important need of a poor person worldwide now has become the need to make money. And this is true in Africa, it's true in the ex-Soviet Union, it's true in China. So, you want to make money, no problem, go get a job, right? Well, let's look at jobs in Africa. In Kenya, only 13% of the labor force has a job in the formal sector, meaning they actually get paid and pay taxes. Half of them are employed by the government, so the formal private sector is tiny. In Tanzania, the formal private sector only employs 3% of the labor force. And these formal private sectors are barely growing. So what do people do? They need money. So they rush to the informal or the survival sector, where they basically do whatever they can to scrape together a few pennies to live. The vast majority of them are doing petty trade. They buy and sell things on the side of the road, buying and sell secondhand clothes, buy and sell maize. I'm doing it, you're doing it, he's doing it, she's doing it. We're all competing with each other. The profit margins are tiny. 
A small percentage get into something more productive, but 95% of them are either doing tailoring, carpentry, or metalwork. Again, we're all producing very low quality products, some to very poor people, it's stiff competition, and there's very little growth. So where is the solution? The formal sector is barely growing in terms of providing jobs, and the informal sector is really desperate. Well, in any country, however poor, there's a percentage of people who are real entrepreneurs. And of course, as we know, this percentage increases if the barrier to entry is low. The only trouble in Africa is 90% of the people are poor, so 90% of the real entrepreneurs are desperately poor also. Nonetheless, if they're truly entrepreneurial, they can beg, borrow, or save a small amount of money. Maybe only $30 to start a business. Maybe somebody like Jane, as much as 500 But then they have two major problems. Their first problem is they have no idea what business to start. They can't do market research. They're not trained. They rarely travel out of their village. They don't watch TV. So coming up with a good business idea is a very difficult thing. But their second problem is even if they have a new business idea, they can't access the technology which will allow them to run that business. A piece of technology that they can afford to buy, afford to operate, and that's going to be profitable to use. These technologies simply don't exist anywhere in the world and certainly don't exist in their small village. So in 1991, we set up a nonprofit called Aprotech in East Africa to help these entrepreneurs come over these constraints. What we do is we develop and mass market technologies that are bought by local entrepreneurs and used to establish very profitable small-scale businesses. And we have a very, very systematic approach which involves these five steps. We identify the profitable business opportunities. We design and develop the required technologies. We select and train manufacturers. We mass market the technologies and monitor the impacts. So we do market research. We say, what are those business opportunities where you can make a lot of money? And not where just one or two people can make a lot of money, but where thousands of people can make a lot of money. We're looking for business opportunities where you can make your investment back in three to six months. Now, why three to six months? These people are farmers. They're used to putting their seeds in the ground for three to six months and getting their money back. You start talking about one year, two years, it's not going to happen. So what are those business opportunities? We also look for business opportunities that are environmentally sustainable. Having identified them, we have a team of engineers and technicians in our own workshop in Nairobi where we actually design the machines and tools required and we also design all the tooling for doing high quality mass production of this equipment. And then we identify and train the largest private sector factories that we can to do high quality mass production of this equipment. Um, very little mass production takes place in Africa, so this involves training them how to do, set up a production line, do quality control, the whole bit. Um, we do that, we buy the technologies from these manufacturers, so they make about 25-30% profit. We then mark up the price of the technologies and we sell the technologies to retail shops all over the country. These are existing farm supply shops and hardware shops. There's about 240 of them we deal with in Kenya and Tanzania. In every small village, in every small town, in every big town, there's one of these shops. They then mark up the price another 16 to 20 percent and sell the technologies to the entrepreneurs. But now comes the hardest part. We're selling a very expensive big ticket item to a very poor person. It's a bit like me trying to sell a $200,000 sports car to any of you in this room. You have to test drive it, you have to think about it, you have to save up your money, you have to be hit over the head with advertising, and finally you'll make your decision and buy the thing. So, in front of every shop, we have a live demonstrator who's demonstrating these technologies with a billboard. We use billboards on the side of the road, we use radio advertisements, we use newspaper advertisements, we mount technologies on the back of pickup trucks, drive into towns and say, hey, here is a great way to make money, go down to your local shop and buy this technology. And then we monitor the impacts. We're trying to be sure that people actually start new livelihoods. Well, do they? We have a very detailed scientific method of monitoring the impacts, which I don't have time to talk about, but I'll be happy to share with anybody later. And what are the impacts? Well, to date, like I say, we started over 29,000 new businesses. In fact, it's over 30,000, I think, as of today. 800 new businesses are being started every month. Between them, these businesses are making over $33 million per year in new profits and wages. On average, people are increasing their incomes by a factor of 10. And between them, if you look at the total income from these businesses, it's over 0.5% of Kenya's GDP. 0.5% of America's GDP is the total income of Cisco plus Microsoft. But the most important thing when you're funding this kind of program is how cost effective are you? How much is it costing you to do all this great work? So we measure what we call the bang for the donor's buck. 
For every thousand dollars that we get from a donor to develop new technologies and develop the market for those new technologies, as a direct result of that thousand dollars, new businesses will be started, which in Kenya will make over twenty thousand dollars in new profits and wages in the first three years of their existence. In fact, they'll go on making it forever, but we only count three years. And what's more, right now it's costing us less than two hundred dollars to take a family out of poverty forever. Other benefits, of course, once families get money, they feed their kids, they get better education, they get better health care, they can start to look after their environment because they don't have to cut down those trees, and of course democracy now starts to work. Other technologies, we have a $75 pump, this one, we have a $38 pump, we just met a guy the other day, made $6,000 profit his first year with a $38 investment, we have an $18 hand pump, we've just developed a new design with a team of designers from IDO here in Palo Alto to design a 60 foot deep pump. And as our pumps get cheaper and cheaper, we're developing two technologies for drilling wells. And one of our older technologies, this machine for making high quality building blocks from soil and cement. Just the other day, an entrepreneur came in to see us from Western Kenya, a man we'd never met before, and he said, I want to thank you guys. We said, okay. He said, look, I bought one of your block presses eight years ago and started making blocks on my small farm in Western Kenya. I bought a second machine. I bought a third machine. I bought a fourth machine. Today I have 45 people working for me out there, and today I own a shopping mall in Nairobi with my own hairdresser and my own video shop. Now, this is the power of technology, the huge leverage and power. And we understand this and we know this, that R&D and market development in technology creates new businesses and new jobs. This is where Silicon Valley came from. And in developing world, the exact same thing can happen. If you put money into technology development and market development for those technologies, you can create sustainable economic growth. And just my last two slides here. We started Apertech in 1991 and have spent about 10 years, first 10 years, developing and proving this model. Um, and now we want to take it to scale. This model will work in any economy moving from a subsistence to a cash-based economy. I came back here in 2001, set up a 501c3 with a fundraising office here in San Francisco. We now want to do a market rollout of our irrigation technologies with other technologies to follow into Uganda, South Africa, Mozambique, Malawi, Rwanda, Burundi, Ghana, Nigeria. And we want to create 120,000 new businesses in the next three to four years. And thanks for taking the time to listen. Thank you, Martin, and you can all take a look at the water pump uh, later outside. Um, back up to the, the larger view, um, the application of science and technology to environmental issues, climate control, etc. How do we modify human behavior to respond to these issues, and what are some of the approaches uh, that the two foundations represented here have taken? We'll start with Lou and follow um, then with Susan. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Martin, I think this is the first time I've shared the podium with a water pump. Um, <laughs> there are a few of you out here that know me very well that probably think that's appropriate. <laughs> um, science and technology and the environment. Um, we believe at more that we need to put more science and technology into the environmental movement. In effect, we need to sort of balance out the head and the heart. And in fact, at Moore, we have probably put about a dollar into science relating to environmental opportunities for every dollar we put directly into protection. And I would suspect that that one-on-one -on -one sort of relationship uh, will continue to exist. So science, technology, we believe is extremely important uh, around environmental issues. The National Science Foundation uh, published in 2001 the results of an interesting study group uh, who were asked to determine what the grand challenges were in environmental science. They came up with eight, uh, which included such things as hydrological forecasting um, and climate variability and those types of things. Uh, their first recommendation, however, was for an immediate investment um, to develop a comprehensive understanding of the relationship of ecosystem structures, ecosystem functioning, and biological diversity. What I want to do is just sort of take a minute talking a little bit about that notion and why it's so important when we think about, about the environment. Uh, we provide money, and, and many others have, 
to set aside protected areas. And in fact, protected areas, whether it's terrestrial or marine, is the dominant um, environmental strategy today. Um, yet, we really do not have a good enough definition of an ecosystem to understand what the boundaries of those protected areas ought to be, to understand what needs to be saved, and to understand what we really mean by biodiversity. So we see a lot of resources running out. Uh, under the strategy that we need to protect what we can because we can uh, or because it's available without truly understanding how you define a protected area, how you define a functioning ecosystem, and maybe even more importantly, how you define biodiversity. And so it's within sort of this core notion of trying to move the head um, along with the heart so that we can get some basic understanding of what's going on. Uh, we have made some interesting grants uh, in a number of areas. Uh, one of the most interesting was a grant to the University of California at Berkeley, which arguably has the best microbiology resources in the United States and maybe in the world today, to see whether or not they could not apply some of that very high-tech knowledge to the problems that I've just defined. In effect, to divert uh, the thrust in microbiology uh, directly into environmental issues. To think about the issue by using evolutionary and development bi biological techniques of whether or not more, some species are more important than other species in an ecosystem. To determine, using advanced scientific techniques, how they evolved to figure out what they really are, to determine the limitations of systematic biology, which generally directs most of our environmental efforts, and to decide whether or not the way we classify creatures is correct. And that is ongoing work, and it's beginning to produce some really interesting results. Um, in California, at least for those of you who are in the, from this area, you'll notice a few oak trees dying periodically. Uh, they are suffering, uh, in most, most likely suffering from sudden oak death. Uh, sudden oak death is an interesting um, phenomenon because we are now witnessing the introduction of a brand new pathogen into a, an ecosystem, or what we think might be an ecosystem, and we can sort of watch the results. It's particularly interesting because it is attacking uh, plants that maybe have a life of two or three or four hundred years and are going to have a hard time using evolution to evolve away from the problem. Uh, by using molecular bi biological techniques, we now know what the pathogen is. We know where it came from. We know what it's closely related to. And we have a pretty good idea of what most of its hosts are. And that's in about a three-year period of time. Traditional science applied to traditional environmental problems could not have gotten there with the accuracy, with the return on investment, um, and with uh, better scientific certainty than we can today given uh, contemporary science. I think I've probably taken more than that. Though. That's great. Thank you. Susan. Well, I've already mentioned our science program, uh, and I will just say a couple of words about our what we call conservation program what everybody else calls environment. Uh, this has been, of course, for a long time, a core interest of the Packard Foundation. Like our science pro uh, program was largely focused in the United States until recently when we made quite a number of changes in our conservation program. Uh, one major change has been a large shift toward international work. And the second, even more major shift with our conservation program is that we actually merged it with our science program. And that's how much we believe that science and environment need to go together. Now, for those of you who come, who come from foundations, you know that it's not always easy to take two programs and put them together. Uh, we, um, of course, have leadership and staff in each of our program areas. We used to have six areas. Now we have three. Uh, and these programs tend to be in silos, just as I mentioned before with the scientific community. 
Meanwhile, our board as a whole, which, by the way, includes five active scientists, which is half of our board, became very interested in this intersection between conservation and science. How can science inform work on the environment, as Lou was talking about? And how can scientists become activists on behalf of the environment and share that information and help influence change? So at first, we tried to have a subcategory in conservation called conservation science. And we had a subcategory in science called sustainability science. But this really didn't work as well as we had wanted because, of course, everybody's focused on their own program goals. And so we put the two programs together. And we have great expectations for, for where we're going to go with this. But it's a very recent phenomenon. But now I'd like to turn to talking about um, the impact of technology on uh, populations and societies, much as Martin was talking, but in a in a different kind of on a different scale, and that is to talk about China. We've been working on something we call the China Sustainable Energy Program for the last four years. Um, it's a partnership with the Energy Foundation, and this is one of those great partnerships where we provide the money and they provide all the work. Well, we do a little work, I guess, and recently the Hewlett Foundation began providing some of the money also. Now, the mission of this program is to assist in China's transition to a sustainable energy future by promoting energy efficiency and renewable energy. Now, you probably all know that China, and we heard about China earlier today, is undergoing major changes and is on track to surpass the United States in carbon emissions by the year 2020. It's a classic example of human development leading to global environmental impacts. Now, fortunately, China is motivated to change its future, and their motivation comes from several factors, and their motivation might be quite different from our motivation in this program. Their motivation comes from uh, not looking at the global issues so much, but from the fact that 10 of the most polluted cities in the world are in China. Car sales grew something like 40 percent last year. So you can imagine that oil imports uh, are going to become critical for China, and they see this as an issue of national security. And then, of course, the Olympics are coming to China in 2008. So the Chinese government has put in place a number of policies governing such things as building codes, mileage standards for cars, efficiency standards for appliances, and energy use in industry, and it's great to see all this activity. Uh, for example, the iron and steel sector consumes 10 percent of China's total energy. I just find that amazing. But each ton of steel produced in China consumes twice as much energy as a ton of steel produced in the United States and three times as much as a ton of steel produced in Japan. So the program seeks to link Chinese policymakers with best practices in a variety of areas that impact energy use. The grantees have largely been government and university-sponsored centers in China. I'm told that there are only 20 or so organizations in all of China registered as NGOs. So the expectation that we would be funding NGOs in this work was, uh, well, I don't know that we had that expectation, but that's not the way it works in China. But in fact, we are funding a couple of those NGOs also. We recently commissioned an evaluation of the program. We haven't seen the full evaluation, but we've seen uh, a first draft. And it's really exciting. It's actually having quite a large impact on where China is going and uh, particularly helpful in driving these, this policy change that I talked about, making sure that best practices are brought to all of these new standards and, and policies that they're putting in place. We'll now open it up to um, questions and raise your hand and the microphones will be brought to you. Vida. Um, I'm Kavita Ramdas from the Global Fund for Women. Thank you, Martin, for a very inspiring um, set of comments and presentations and a wonderful amount of energy to bring into this room. Um, each year at the Global Fund, we make hundreds of grants, small grants to women's groups working to increase women and girls' economic opportunities and their access to economic resources. Um, often, groups themselves, local community-based organizations, are working on ways to sustain not only the income generating opportunities for members of the communities that they are in, but also for the group um, and the activities of the group. 
I'm wondering whether your organization has ever considered a partnership with a non-profit or community-based organization um, to help their own sustainability. Many of these organizations provide services that either the government, as you pointed out, or the private sector simply cannot provide. And uh, they are concerned both with um, raising the economic sustainability of people who live in the community, but also of these organizations. Um, for example, have you ever worked with a microcredit program that gives some of the individuals you talked about access to credit um, with which they can actually purchase some of the equipment or worked with, a, um, uh, with an organization to make it possible for them to actually use some of the, um, you know, some of the, org um, some of the equipment that you talked about enable, and enable the organization to make money. I'd be very interested to hear about um, what potential you see for such partnerships and I'd love to talk to you about how the Global Fund can work with you. Um, let me first say that it turns out that 60% of the businesses started using our technologies are in fact managed by women, um, which is, is a very important fact. Um, in fact, a number of small nonprofits and uh, local community groups do use our technologies in order to generate funds for their activities. In terms of microcredit, um, we did have a partnership with KWFT, which I'm sure you're, you're at least aware of, in Kenya, one of the largest uh, microfinance groups there. But there was really a very poor match between what we were doing in microfinance. The reason is that the vast majority of microfinance is still in urban and peri-urban areas, and we're working very much in the rural areas. On top of that, microfinance is generally set up to work with high cash flow businesses, uh, where you have to start repaying your working capital and you have to start repaying your loan immediately. And of course, as a farming business, you want at least three months uh, loan holiday before you could repay. Um, so although microfinance could in fact greatly magnify what we're doing, um, there's a fairly poor match between the existing institutions and, uh, and the kind of people who are taking, uh, are buying our technologies. Interestingly also, in terms of microfinance, it's interesting to note that to establish a microfinance organization um, and to give, put an organization in place and establish one new borrower costs somewhere between $300 and $500 to do that. Um, while um, we're actually already selling our technologies for under $200 um, per person who actually now buys a technology and starts a whole new um, livelihood. I think that there's clearly an enormous contribution that science and technology can make in human development and it's certainly something that we know a lot about in Silicon Valley and where we have a lot to contribute in terms of the knowledge. Um, but if science and technology are linked to progress in human development, they're also clearly linked to business and the private sector. And my question is, what is the role of corporations in applying science and technology towards human development? And what is their responsibility? Let me take uh, a crack that will maybe answer 10 or 15 percent of, of what you, you've said there. Um, clearly we're seeing the issue of science and technology and the responsibility of, of corporations probably nowhere more clear than the issue of vaccines and drugs in Africa. You've heard quite a bit of that, about that today, and so I don't really want to go into the middle of that. But I think the fact of the matter is, is that there's limits to what, what business is going to be willing to do in the long run, and that those limits create an opportunity for philanthropy to create markets. So to the extent that philanthropy can, can fill the gap between uh, the invisible hand and what can be afforded in the marketplace, it's probably a good place. Now, can you get corporate uh, America or a corporate global to sort of move a little bit more towards uh, some of these marketplaces that just don't have the wherewithal to afford their products? Probably. But my guess is, is that either governments or private philanthropy is going to have to fill that gap and that the sense of responsibility to the shareholders versus the sense of responsibility to humanity will remain somewhat in conflict. 
Yeah, I'd like to, to add to that um, the responsibility of, of corporations in sustainable development. And it's been interesting to watch over the last, oh, 10 years where there have been many meetings of nations around the world to come to some agreements about uh, common goals and particularly around global environmental issues. And if you look at some of the targets that they set forth 10 years ago in Rio, for example, um, virtually all of those have gone in the wrong direction. So with the exception of, of perhaps the ozone layer, we've really made very little progress at the government level. But at the same time, there has been some progress made at the corporate level, and it's been really interesting to watch that. It's kind of unexpected. So for example, I'm sure you've all read about uh, oil companies who have agreed to reduce their own CO2 emissions and have met their targets. BP in particular is the leader in this, but some others also. Um, there are examples of, uh, well, in those market sectors that I mentioned, in forestries, Home Depot has agreed to to buy their lumber from sustainable forests, and we'll see how that goes. And their company's uh, major processes of fish that are also moving toward agreeing to work with sustainable fisheries. So I think there is a real uh, role for the corporate sector in sustainable development, and I think it's very heartening to see that in a lot of ways they're stepping up to that. Senator over there. Uh, my name is Dan Sharp, and I've been asked by the Royal Institution of Great Britain to create a world science and technology assembly that will convene uh, world leaders, decision makers, and Nobel level scientists on the most critical global issues that are driven by new science and technology. And I'd like to invite uh, your help in addressing a, a key challenge we face, which is to say if, if you were to have an opportunity to uh, convene the most important world decision makers on which one or two or three of the many, many public policy issues that have already been addressed, starting with Nancy Birdsall and on through your own, which are the one or two or three that would have the most catalytic effect uh, of achieving the goals that you're trying to do, on the assumption that if you're going to get world leaders' attention, uh, you've got to start with just a few issues, not on all of the issues that you're dealing with. We uh, expect to get their commitment and engagement on these issues, but which are the most important ones? Thank you very much. Go ahead. Go ahead, Lou. Uh, <laughs> I guess by the process of elimination here. I, I, I think there's two sort of aspects to your question that are interesting. One is directly the question you asked, and that is how would you focus such an assembly? Um, and I think that you probably have a number of choices, and I wouldn't necessarily say that one is better than the other. Um, poverty could be a focus. The environment could be a focus. Um, a number of things can. And I don't have a good sense. The other issue, though, that is lurking in the background, uh, which I think is extremely important, is the fact that world leaders and policymakers have not kept up with science and technology. And so we have this really interesting gap between the ability of policymakers and governors to make policy and govern in face of what science and technology is now producing. And the record out there seems to me to be somewhat dismal. Uh, you've clearly seen it in the United States in terms of some of the issues that have gotten politicized. You clearly see it around the GMO issues. You see it around a lot of issues. And so this notion of how do we get or build capacity long term with, with policy makers, uh, people in positions of authority to be literate enough with science and technology so that they can make the appropriate choices, uh, I think is an extraordinarily interesting issue. I'd just like to add to that. Um, we're, we're very fortunate to have on our board a woman named Jane Lubchenco, who is the president, the current president of the of ICSU, the International Council of Scientific Unions. Uh, and w one of her, well, she has many, many interests, and she's a really extraordinary woman. But one of the things she really pushed us to do was this very question about how you get scientists more engaged in the political process. And so we funded something un under her leadership, again, called the Aldo Leopold Leadership Program. And we took 60 scientists uh, and gave them intensive training in advocacy 
and it was everything from how do you go testify in Congress, how do you write op-ed pieces, um, and how do you engage in the policy setting agenda arena so that you can have it, bring scientific knowledge into the process. And my bias is, uh, I think, clearly that science and technology for economic development is the most important thing we can do. Um, because if we can provide livelihoods for people, once people have money, the reality is these other things are already there. I lived in Africa 18 years. I didn't get sick because I could afford health care. We actually have all the drugs we needed. Okay, not for HIV AIDS, but without that, other than that. Um, we have clean water. Clean water is a simple technology. It's just we don't have people who can afford to pay for clean water. Um, education. You can afford to pay for education if you have the money. So I think that if we can concentrate on economic development and science and technology for economic development, these other things will all fall in line. In the back. Legacy Venture. Chris Iyer from Legacy Venture. Um, we've, we've heard it strikes me, uh, first of all, I express appreciation for the in incredible convocation this is, and we have We've heard some from some brilliant thinkers that have spent a considerable amount of time thinking about poverty, much longer than I have. And we have millions, billions of dollars that have been addressed by large government organizations and foundations. A simple question from a simple mind. <laughs> Isn't it, isn't it possible with all our brilliance that we sometimes lose sight of the fact that the poor understand their poverty better than any of us? And that if we simply can remove some of the barriers that exist, access to technology, access to credit, access to markets, that many of these issues can have significant, uh, can be addressed in a significant way by, by the poor, and, and, and I guess I would ask the panel, is that a possible trend in terms of broad philanthropic thinking that in terms, of, instead of what sometimes comes across to me as somewhat of a condescending attitude towards those in poverty, to instead engage more with them and remove some of the barriers that allow them to lift themselves out of poverty? I you more. Um, the poor do know what they want, and uh, they don't always have all the answers. But if we simply make technology available, if we make the markets work um, on the, and, and make the technology available through those markets, they will use their own um, entrepreneurial and uh, drive to pull themselves out of poverty. Um, the people who've invested in our irrigation pumps have invested over $5 million of their own money to buy these technologies. This is money which extremely poor people have pulled together. There's a huge amount of resources amongst the poor, and if they have the right opportunity, they'll spend their money to better their families, just like we will. Two more brief questions and answers here. Yes. Thanks. I'm Ellen Leipzig from the Stimson Center in Washington. I wondered if the two foundation representatives would talk about whether you have processes or methods of making sure that the science and technology research and ideas that you sponsor and support have only civilian application. Have you ever funded or supported some technological work that had an application that surprised you and that maybe was not seen as a net benefit to society and that you wish in hindsight you had not funded? <laughs> Go to it. <laughs> well, uh, speaking for the Packard Foundation, our, our, um, our program that I mentioned, the Packard Fellows Program, which funds, uh, we have 100 young scientists and engineers in any one year working under Packard Fellowship money. And they're working on all kinds of myriad things from astrophysics to diseases in rice. And uh, it's altogether possible that some of that work will, will be used in, in what you might consider inappropriate technology in the future. Uh, again, going back to my father's core belief that science Science will lead to wonderful results in the end, although, of course, what you might think was a bad result might not be what he would have thought was a bad result. Um, but that you have, to, you have to let it go where it's going to go, and that's how you get the best results. Last question. Oh, go ahead. Quickly, I'd, yeah. I'd sort of second that. We, uh, 
We recently made a grant uh, to some large NGOs in Gabon to uh, provide park guard training. Uh, I don't know how many guns we bought. I didn't want to buy any guns, but I guess we bought some guns. And we probably will continue to do that. Very difficult issue. Conversely, on our environmental side, we would love to see the flow go the other way. We would love to know what the navies know about the ocean. Uh, we would love to get access to much better satellite data, particularly the low angle satellite data on what's happening in the environment. So uh, there needs to be some level of partnership that gets the job done without uh, which we probably can't get the job done. With an invitation to those who still have questions to speak to our panelists later, one last question. Yeah, my name is Robert Van Buskirk. I work with the Eritrea Technical Exchange. I think one issue that comes in using technology for income generation is the extent to which the income that is booked to the project is really new income rather than income which is shifted from less competitive members of the community. I think Apertech booked the entire income as net new income uh, in calculating its 20 to 1 benefit cost ratio. What methods did you use to investigate the income shifting versus the income generation effects? Um, well, of course, anytime does measurement on impacts, one has to be very, very careful about these displacement issues, and we are very careful about them. Um, the way we do our impact monitoring is every piece of technology that gets sold comes with a one-year guarantee, and the entrepreneur or farmer comes into the local retail shop and fills out with the help. They're usually illiterate, so they fill out with the help of the um, shopkeeper the guarantee form where they put their name and they put the location closest to where they're going to use the technology, usually the nearest primary school or nearest church. Of course, they don't have addresses and phone numbers. Uh, we then get a database of all the people who've bought this technology. We randomly select people out of this database, and we go and visit them within the first month of when they've bought the technology, and they've had no impact from it. We discuss with them in detail about their total income from the previous year and about their present incomes. We then come back to these same people 18 months later, and we only count the change in, tech, in uh, income when we're looking here. The other thing is that when you're talking about something like irrigation, um, in the dry seasons, um, most farmers do very, very little in terms of income generation. And so there's not that big a displacement. Um, and we always look at the displacement issue when we're talking about a new business and are we displacing people in the other businesses. What about, co what about, what about competition effects in, in where your new business of creating oil is displacing some other oil producer elsewhere? Absolutely. In Kenya, 85% of the cooking oil is imported from Indonesia, where it's very, very highly subsidized by the government. Um, and uh, the local cooking oil business is very, very small and growing. And uh, it simply can't compete with the, I mean, the local prices are lower than the imported prices. Um, and so is there a little bit of displacement somewhere in Indonesia in a, in a big, uh, highly subsidized uh, cooking oil plant? Possibly there is but not in Kenya. <laughs> Before I thank our panelists, two things. One, um, the breakout sessions scheduled uh, for this afternoon and tomorrow morning will be in Fisher Hall, not in Encina Hall. So Fisher Hall is where you're headed, and the Global Philanthropy staff will guide you there. And um, we also will take about a 10 to 15 minute very quick break if you would up and, and leave your tables and then look for the names of those people you wish to um, be at lunch with. And now thank you very much to Lou, Susan, and Martin for their participation. <laughs>